Jamie Dimon is the CEO of JP Morgan, which is the largest bank in the United States. Given that Jamie is the CEO of the largest bank in the US, you can imagine that he has some pretty deep and valuable insights surrounding the economy. He recently shared these insights in a JP Morgan letter to shareholders. And in this letter, he gives a warning to investors about the valuations in the market, future interest rates, inflation expectations, and more. Honestly, it was a pretty grim letter where he sounds cautious about investor expectations versus reality. So in today's video, I want to discuss some of the key points Jamie mentioned, explain my own opinions on them, and also explain what I am going to be doing with my investments moving forward. So with that being said, let's hop right into the video. All right, so here is the first passage from the JP Morgan letter to shareholders that I want to discuss. And this says, in spite of the unsettling landscape, including last year's regional bank turmoil, the US economy continues to be resilient resilient, with consumers still spending and the markets currently expecting a soft landing. It is important to note that the economy is being fueled by large amounts of government deficit spending and past stimulus. There is also a growing need for increased spending as we continue transitioning to a greener economy, restructuring global supply chains, boosting military expenditure, and battling rising healthcare costs. This may lead to stickier inflation and higher rates than markets expect. Furthermore, there are downside risks to watch. Quantitative tightening is draining more than $900 billion in liquidity from the system annually, and we have never truly experienced the full effects of quantitative tightening at this scale. Plus, the ongoing wars in Ukraine and the Middle East continue to have the potential to disrupt energy and food markets, migration and military and economic relationships, in addition to their dreadful human cost. These significant and somewhat unprecedented forces cause us to remain cautious. So as you can see, this letter starts off pretty grim. However, Jamie Dimon is saying that the US economy is currently remaining resilient and the soft landing seems like it could actually happen. However, he is a little bit cautious about all of the government spending that is still going on. And he is worried that this could lead to stickier and longer inflation than markets are currently expecting. And if inflation does in fact remain sticky, then he is saying that interest rates could also remain higher for longer. And he's actually even hinting that maybe interest rates might have to rise further over the next few years. And the reason for this is simply because there is still so much government spending going on. And when the governments spend and issue massive amounts of debt, it adds in more liquidity to the overall system, which overall means that there is more money flowing around and there is more money in the system, which causes the end result to be stickier inflation. So while governments are continuing to spend a record amount of money and take on records amount of debt, Jamie Dimon is basically saying that he is not convinced that inflation is going to go down while they are doing so. Now, moving on to the next passage, this says, in the policy section, we talk about how we may be entering one of the most treacherous geopolitical eras since World War II. And I have written in the past about high levels of debt, fiscal stimulus, ongoing deficit spending, and the unknown effects of quantitative tightening, which I am more worried about than most. So I will not repeat those views here. However, the impacts of these geopolitical and economic forces are large and somewhat unprecedented. They may not seem fully understood until they have completely played out over multiple years. In any case, JP Morgan Chase must be prepared for the various potential impacts and outcomes on our company and our people. So Jamie is saying here that he believes the world is entering a pretty treacherous geopolitical era, and one that we have not really seen since World War II. And it's worth noting that this letter right here was actually written before the recent events that happened overnight last night. So he is just saying that the world seems to be pretty tense right now, and there seems to be a lot of geopolitical issues going on. He also writes that this is partly why we need to restructure the global supply chain, because even really before COVID, we had a lot of our supply chains reliant on single countries. And then when COVID came and the global economy shut down, we kind of realized that, hey, maybe we shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket, and we should move some of our manufacturing and our supply chains back home, or at least spread them out through multiple different countries. And of course, this spawns a lot more government spending. So with these geopolitical tensions that we have going on and kind of this de-globalization that we are seeing, Jamie Dimon is just saying that, you know, this may cause some more debt, some more stimulus, and some more uncertainty around the global economy. Now, moving on to the next slide here, this says, we have ongoing concerns about persistent inflationary pressures and we consider a wide range of outcomes to manage interest rate exposure and other business risks. Many key economic indicators today continue to be good and possibly improving, including inflation. But when looking ahead to tomorrow, conditions that will affect the future should be considered. For example, there seems to be a large number of persistent inflationary pressures, which may likely continue. All of the following factors appear to be inflationary. 
ongoing fiscal spending, remilitarization of the world, restructuring of global trade, capital needs of the new green economy, and possibly higher energy costs in the future. Even though there currently is an oversupply of gas and plentiful spare capacity in oil, due to a lack of needed investment in energy infrastructure. In the past, fiscal deficits did not seem to be closely related to inflation. In the 1970s and early 1980s, there was a general understanding that inflation was driven by guns and butter. Or in other words, fiscal deficits and the increase to the money supply, both partially driven by the Vietnam War, led to increased inflation, which went over 10%. The deficits today are even larger and occurring in boom times, not as a result of a recession, and they have been supported by quantitative easing, which has never been done before the great financial crisis. Quantitative easing is the form of increasing the money supply, though it has many offsets. I remain more concerned about quantitative easing than most, and its reversal, which has never been done before at this scale. So basically, Jamie is saying once again here that there are a lot of outside factors that could cause increased inflation for a longer period of time. Then he also notes that the large amounts of inflation that happened in the 1970s and the 1980s was largely because of the Vietnam War and all of these stimulus that had to happen for the U.S. to fight that war. However, now he is saying that a large amount of stimulus is happening even when the economy is not in a recession. For those of you who may not know, historically, government stimulus has happened during recessions to kind of keep the gears of capitalism well-oiled and keep the economy going. However, we are seeing government stimulus now after 2008, even though the overall economy is not in a recession, and the economy actually does seem like it is quite strong. And again, this is kind of unique when we take a look at the past 100 years of the overall economy. Now also, historically, government stimulus used to be really just lowering interest rates because interest rates were high and when you lower interest rates you can increase the overall liquidity in the economy however when interest rates are low and at zero percent like they were before covid then you have to do additional measures to stimulate the economy and that is where we get a large amount of quantitative easing or in other words as jamie explains right here quantitative easing is the form of increasing the money supply so when interest rates hit zero then the government has to figure out, again, another way to support or stimulate the overall economy, which is increasing the money supply and doing quantitative easing. Keep this in mind because we are going to talk about this later on in the video, but keep in mind that historically, governments used to lower interest rates to stimulate the economy. But when interest rates hit zero or close to zero, then you have to do another form of stimulus, which again is increasing the money supply and doing quantitative easing. Now, moving on to the next screenshot that says, Equity values by most measures are at the high end of the valuation range, and credit spreads are extremely tight. The market seems to be pricing in at a 70-80% to 80 chance of a soft landing, modest growth along with declining inflation and interest rates. I believe the odds are a lot lower than that. In the meantime, there seems to be an enormous focus, too much so, on monthly inflation data and modest changes to interest rates, but the die may be in the cast. Interest rates looking out a year or two may be predetermined by all of the factors that I mentioned above. Small changes in interest rates today may have less impact on inflation in the future than many people believe. So this paragraph is pretty interesting because first off, Jamie Dimon is saying that he believes that equity values are on the high end of the range. And as I have said recently on my channel, I do agree. I do not think that the market is currently in a bubble, but when you take a look at the current price to earnings ratio of the S&P 500 versus its history, it is definitely, definitely on the higher end, which does lead me to believe that there is a lot of overvaluation going on in the markets. And as I have said repeatedly on my channel over the past few months, I do believe that this is the case as well, especially when you take a look at some of the leading stocks in the market like Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, and even Tesla. So I do agree with Jamie that the overall market is looking pretty expensive, and specifically there are stocks in the market, especially the leading stocks that do look very, very expensive. Then Jamie goes on to describe what investors are currently expecting and pricing into the market, which seems to be about an 80% chance of a, of a soft landing, modest growth with declining inflation and interest rates. So this is almost like a Goldilocks period that the market is pricing in. This is like if everything goes perfect. So Jamie kind of says that he believes that the market is pricing in perfection with the overall economy, but he is not convinced that we are going to see a soft landing, declining interest rates, and declining inflation overall with continued U.S. economic growth. So he is just being cautious and he's warning people that, hey, if we don't get this perfect economic future that the market is currently pricing in, then maybe equity values can come down and maybe things will correct themselves 
because investor expectations seem to not be reflecting reality right now. He is also saying that the market seems to be very reactive on a month by month basis, depending on what inflation is currently doing and depending on what the Fed wants to do with interest rates over the next year or so. However, he is saying that we should not be focusing on the month to month inflation data, but instead we should be focusing on these things that can potentially increase inflation over a longer period of time. And he is also saying that these small interest rate changes that we are expecting over the next year may not be enough to combat these inflationary pressures that Jamie Dimon talks about in this letter. Then Jamie continues on where he writes, there is too much emphasis on short term monthly data and too little on long term trends and what may happen in the future that would influence long term outcomes. For example, today there is tremendous interest in monthly inflation data, although it seems to me that every long term trend I see increases inflation relative to the last 20 years. So for those of you who may not know, over the past 24 years, inflation has averaged about 3% in the US. And Jamie is saying that he believes these inflationary trends that he is seeing that he did mention in this letter could cause inflation to be higher over the next 20 years. So basically the inflation levels that we saw previously over the last 20 years, he is not convinced we will see or be sustained over the next few decades. And then again, he says huge fiscal spending, the trillions needed each year for the green economy, the remilitarization of the world and restructuring of global trade are all inflationary. I'm not sure models could pick this up. And you must use judgment if you want to evaluate impacts like these. So he is simply just warning investors that these things could cause more inflation going forward. So now let's move on and kind of talk about what is currently going on in the economy. So as of last month, inflation came in hotter than expected for the month of March. And here we can see that inflation is stubbornly remaining above 3%. And in the most recent couple of months, inflation has actually been trending back up, not in a major way, but it is starting to trend a little bit back up. And this right here is kind of what Jamie was talking about, where he said that there are extra inflationary pressures that is causing inflation to remain a little bit more sticky than maybe people are thinking or realizing. And then I found this article recently as well, where it says investors now anticipate two 25 basis point cuts this year, down from the six cuts expected at the start of the year. So now that inflation is clearly remaining stickier and inflation is actually ticking up again, it seems like investors are lowering their expectations for rate cuts in 2024. At the beginning of the year, the market was expecting six rate cuts this year. And now it seems like the market is expecting two rate cuts. So as inflation is remaining stickier, the Fed seems like they are more reluctant to lower interest rates and maybe will keep them higher for longer. Now, moving on to the next chart right here, this comes from JP Morgan's Guide to the Markets. And we can see that the US GDP growth is right back to its 2% annual growth trend. And this is on top of the stickier inflation above 3%, which is still above the Fed's 2% inflation target. On top of this, just today, Fed's Goolsby says progress on inflation has stalled and it makes sense to wait on cutting interest rates. And then another article came out just today that says Wall Street pushes out rate cut expectations, sees risk that they don't start until March of 2025. So now it seems like the market is expecting rate cuts to potentially even start in the first quarter of 2025. So as inflation is not really coming down, it seems like the market and investors are expecting or pushing out when the Fed will actually start to cut interest rates. Now, what this has also caused is an increase to the 10 year bond. So overall bond interest rates or bond yields are starting to increase again. And this is kind of suggesting that the Fed is not going to cut interest rates in the near future, or at least not as quickly as the market was expecting. Now, if you have been watching my channel for some time, then you know that the 10 year bond is also considered the risk free rate. And as the 10 year bond increases, the overall valuation of the stock market and equities in general should decline because investors can be getting a higher risk free return by buying bonds. So basically, when bond yields increase, it makes every other investment opportunity less attractive because, again, investors can be getting higher returns risk free for simply buying bonds. So the overall attractiveness of other investments like equities becomes less attractive as bonds become more attractive and offer higher yields. And in my opinion, if the 10 year bond does stay around this 5% level, then it does look like stocks in general are actually quite expensive. So now let's move on to my opinion on everything that we just discussed. And then I will also discuss what I am currently doing in my portfolio and what I plan to do going forward. So here's my opinion, which may be a little bit of a controversial one. I don't know why we need to cut interest rates. I mean, we just saw that US GDP growth is back to its historical trend. So the US economy actually does seem to be doing pretty well, at least right now. 
and inflation is starting to tick back up again. So with the US economy at least doing well right now, and with inflation ticking back up again, I don't really know why everyone is so eager to lower interest rates, because historically, when you lower interest rates, it is an inflationary pressure, and it does increase inflation. So if inflation is currently going up, then why do we want to lower interest rates? Because that would just cause, at least in my opinion, it would just cause inflation to be more sticky or potentially even go up further. And if the US economy is at least faring well right now, then why do we want to stimulate the US economy even further by lowering interest rates? So I actually don't think that right now we need to lower interest rates because as Jamie Dimon said in his letter, historically, you want to do government stimulus in a time of a recession or in a time when the economy is struggling and it needs that it needs that extra lubricant and it needs that extra stimulus to keep the gears of capitalism running. However, right now, the gears of capitalism seem to be running at least okay. So again, I don't know why everyone is so eager and wanting interest rates to drop prematurely, in my opinion. I think that we should actually be leaving them where they are and not really touching everything until we see some maybe more weakness in the economy, GDP slows down, or maybe we enter a recession. Because at least historically, that is when we have been lowering interest rates. And that is when we should lower interest rates, in my own opinion. As Peter Lynch has said, the job of the Fed is to take away the punch bowl just as the party is getting going. And what he means is the Fed is the people who should be responsible for the overall US economy and making sure that people's temperaments and everything are kept in check. So if we were to lower interest rates right now, when everything kind of seems like it's going just fine, then all that would do is kind of add excess to the system and maybe allow people to take on more risk, maybe cause a little bit more inflation, which I don't actually think is best for the US economy. Now, I remember earlier on in the video when I said when interest rates hit 0% and the Fed wants to continue stimulating the economy, then what they have to do is quantitative easing, which is adding more money to the overall system, which is definitely an inflationary pressure. So in my opinion, I don't understand the want to lower interest rates immediately when we arguably don't really need to, because right now interest rates are around that 5%, right? So we do have a 5% buffer where we could lower interest rates to stimulate the economy if we do enter a recession before we need to do more quantitative easing. But if we lower interest rates to say 3% tomorrow, and then a recession comes next year and rates are at 3%, then we do not have as much of a buffer before the government needs to do more quantitative easing, which we all saw the outcomes of that. It's a very inflationary thing. So basically what I'm trying to say is if interest rates are actually higher, then we have a larger buffer before the government needs to do a quantitative easing like we saw during COVID. So I actually think that it is safer for the overall economy if we can manage to keep interest rates higher. In my opinion, I honestly believe that the Fed should keep interest rates as high as they possibly can while the U.S. is still seeing economic growth. And the U.S. is still seeing economic growth right now. So I think that they should leave interest rates where they are. And if the U.S. economy continues growing, then why not even increase interest rates if the U.S. economy can handle it? Because again, it gives us more of a buffer for when things do go wrong. In my opinion, it also seems like the market and investors have kind of become addicted to low interest rates because we all know that low interest rates means stocks soar, speculative frenzies happen, and people typically make more money. But the byproduct of this is probably more inflation and an overall weakening of the economy. So I think that this is a mistake for us to lower interest rates prematurely. And I actually do agree with the Fed that they should keep interest rates higher for longer. All right, now to wrap up the video, let's talk about what I am doing in regards to my own investing. Well, as you guys know, I am going to simply keep on buying stocks that I think are offering value. I am not an index investor, so if the overall index is expensive, then I can still find stocks that I think are offering value within the overall markets. So whether the index is high, low, sideways, or whatever it's doing, I plan on continuing to buy stocks, and I'm not someone who really hoards cash. I am fortunate that I do have excess cash coming in every single month, so my only goal really is to continue deploying that cash as it continues to come in in whichever stocks that I do believe are, believe are offering value. And as you guys know on my channel, I am able to find value in pretty much any market and I am consistently deploying cash wherever I can within my portfolios. So for me, I am probably always going to be buying stocks and I'm always going to be dollar cost averaging in my portfolio wherever I think that there is significant value. So again, if the market is up, down, sideways, crashing or whatever, I will simply continue buying stocks. And that is as simple as I can possibly get. And if you do wanna stay on top of all the stocks that I am buying within all of my portfolios in real time, 
then you can join my Patreon and you will also get a lot of other benefits like joining my Discord, being able to ask me any questions, getting Patreon-only content, Patreon-only portfolio updates, Patreon-only stock picks, and all of my stock buys and sells in real time. So if you are interested in joining my Patreon, then I will leave a link in the description and you can get access to all of that. But that is going to wrap up the video for today, everyone, and let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I know that this was a little bit more of a controversial video for me, but those are just my honest thoughts, and I would love to hear your guys' thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you did enjoy this video, then please remember to leave a like on it, as it does really help out the channel. And if you're new here, then please consider subscribing to the channel as well. But with all that being said, thank you all so much again for watching. I truly do appreciate it, and I really hope to see you all again in my next video.